Thank you for the introduction, and it's, it's great to be here. As uh, Bernie mentioned, I'm uh, at Dalhousie, located at Dalhousie University at the School of Information Management. I'm also a director of the social media lab uh, at Dalhousie. A little bit uh, about uh, the lab, it's a multidisciplinary unit, uh, the school, where we study how people use in social media, but also how social media are changing the way we communicate, we share information, we establish contacts, we manage our social contacts, and so on. In the lab, we also develop tools and techniques to help us to understand and analyze different online communities. And so one of the tools uh, that uh, Bernie mentioned I will be talking about today called Netlytic. All right, so as you know, more and more people join in social media and social networking websites every day. And so as a result, their contributions and personal online networks are growing exponentially every, every day. And so this abundance of social media and social networking data is really a great opportunity for us researchers to try to understand what's really happening in different online communities. But at the same time, this is a challenge, right? How do, how do you analyze all this avalanche of online data? Uh, how do you make sense out of it? How do you gain timely access to relevant information to support uh, decision making? <laughs> So those are some of the questions, uh, general questions that I'm trying to answer in, in my research. And I will be showing demo and how to use Netlytic a little bit later, uh, which uh, essentially being developed by a number of students uh, uh, now in the social media lab. But it is started as, a, as part of my PhD, uh, PhD research and it, we've been developing it for, you know, since then for about 10 years now. First, before I go and I'll show you demo, I would like to focus on one of the unique features of this system, which is uh, specifically trying, focusing on trying to discover social networks from text-based conversations. First, I'm going to try to convince you, even though I'm sure it's not that difficult to do for this crowd, to convince you why it's important to find information about online social networks. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about how you do it. I'll talk about uh, two different approaches, and then we'll talk about uh, you know, techniques and tools, how, how you can do it yourself. Well, first of all, why, why is it good to have a network representation of online community? According to some estimates, about 70% of all data being generated on the internet are driven by users, essentially user-generated data. Uh, so as a result, social networks and social networks analysis is a great way to represent this data so that at the same time we can maintain and keep social context which can tell us about people and groups behind this data. How this data was generated, by whom, how it's been shared, for what reasons, and so on. So in network representation we we'll usually talk about nodes which represent people uh, it can represent also pieces of information, other virtual objects. Uh, but for the purposes of this uh, presentation, we'll primarily focus at uh, social networks of people. And edges, connections between nodes represent different kinds of relations. So why is it useful to have that kind of representation of online community? From user's perspective, uh, we can use that network to build better user interfaces. We can build uh, more useful recommendation systems. And Amazon and Netflix are great examples of systems where it can take information about your social connections and give you something useful uh, based on that information. Well, Facebook or LinkedIn, another great example how information about social connections uh, can help you to share information easier or find information that you need or contact people, establish no, new contacts, and so on. Uh, another application is web, what we call web of trust. So if we know network representation, who is connected to whom online, we can facilitate a more secure and easy uh, methods to share information among trusted individuals without actually asking you for lots of lots of uh, passwords and usernames. For companies, they've been taking advantage of social networks for quite a while now. Uh, there are studies showing how they can use uh, information about networks to recruit talents, to find experts, and of course, marketers love social networks. They you know, can conduct viral marketing, they can uh, 
help them to build uh, brand uh, loyal communities and so on. Finally, us researchers. Uh, we can now ask and answer deeper questions about various online communities and how they operate. So some of the questions that I'm especially interested in, uh, uh, such as how and why one online community emerges and another dies, how people agree on common practices and rules in a community, how knowledge and information is shared among group members. So those are general questions. But having this network representation does help us to uh, answer those questions and generate more questions. So hope, hopefully by now, um, I sold you the idea that it's really great and useful uh, you know, tool to have online social networks to study different communities. Now, how do we do that? Well, traditionally, we can conduct what we call a network survey or interview uh, where, where we can ask all members of a group about their connections to other members within this group. Uh, so here is a sample question about uh, students' perceived social structures. So this is from my study with the students who are taking online class. And we wanted to build a network representation of their different connections. So we ask each student a set of questions uh, such as this one. Please indicate on a scale from 1 to 5 your friendship relationship with each student in this class. And so options one, don't know this person. You, you will be surprised, uh, but it's true that sometimes in online classes, people might not even know other members in the group. Uh, just another, number two, just another member of class. Number three, slight friendship. Five, friend and close friends. And so essentially you have, you have to rank each member of the class and it's, you know, relatively straightforward when you have 15 people in the group. What if you have 100 uh, students? What if you have online group members, which is often the case for online communities, right? Uh, so you can see the problems and time-consuming nature of such surveys. And keep in mind that this is a question just based on one relation, uh, which is friendship. But quite often in this research, we want to ask questions about all kinds of relationships. Uh, friendship, advice, work, collaborate, and so on. So surveys, network surveys, time consuming, they're resource intensive, and the types of questions tend to be very sensitive in nature. So as a result, we want to look for other ways to find information about uh, online networks. Uh, and besides, uh, previous research also indicated that people tend to give partial answers, that's not surprising. People tend to forget uh, about the interactions or connections in, in networks, and they may actually perceive events differently. So the question for my research is, how do you discover online social networks automatically? And luckily, <coughs> on the internet, if you study online communities, there are lots of lots of data available for you that can help you to discover tho those networks automatically. And there are lots of uh, different types of networks. You have email network, you have forum network, you have blog networks, friends networks, networks of like-minded individuals on YouTube, and so on. So every time we send a message to someone, every time we post a comment, every time we click a like button, those interactions essentially explicitly or implicitly connect us to other individuals online, and they're all be being recorded, and as a result, we can use that to kind of rebuild, reconstruct a social structure of a community. So in my particular research, I'm interested in using, as I mentioned, text-based conversations to reconstruct social structures. And text-based conversations, text-based platforms are still very prevalent and uh, will be in the near future on the internet to support various online communities. So I think it's really important for us to understand how we can use conversational data to find all kinds of, uh, kinds of relationship and connections. So essentially, we can look at these two general questions. How to discover social networks from text-based online interactions automatically? And what content-based features of online interactions can help to uncover nodes and ties between group members? So simply put, how do we go from this bunch of messages, comments, they may or may not be threaded discussions, uh, to something like that, to the network representation. 
But let's start with simple emails. Uh, with email communications, it's easy to find out who talks to whom because usually you know who sent the message and who's supposed to receive it. So using that information, you can say you have three people and they exchange messages. And then you can count how many messages they sent to each other. And you can say, based on the number of messages, that's how strong their relationship is. So that's one approach, right? But in social media, we usually talk about many-to-many -many connections. Uh, so sometimes it's not obvious or clear that who actually sent a message or who's supposed to receive it. Because many people, once message posted, many group members can read it. Or, so essentially, we don't know who actually had received the message. So how do you deal with that uncertainty? How do you build networks uh, based on this data? Um, we're going to look at two approaches today. So the first one, what I call chain network. And um, let's imagine you know who sent the message. And let's imagine you have a sequence of messages. So you know who sent the previous message in that sequence. Uh, so if you have a message from somebody like Sam, here exam example, and the po previous poster, previous user who posted the message was Gabriel. Using this chain network approach, you can say, well, let's connect Sam to the previous uh, poster in this uh, discussion, Gabriel. But the limitation of this approach is that if you look at the content of the message, uh, this message was not just referring to Gabriel, but Nick and Gina are also addresses on, in that message. So we're possibly missing six different connections here. Or, so we, from Sam to Nick, from Sam to Gina, from Nick to Gina, and so on. And this is because we can say, well, Sam is talking to Nick, Gina, and Gabriel. But we can also say, because Nick, Gina, and Gabriel are mentioned together in one sentence, they somehow relate it as well. So we might want to build all the connections between them as well. So, so looking at this type of um, messages uh, during my thesis work at the University of Illinois, uh, I decided, why don't we explore uh, and um, how we can use personal names inside of the, of the message to derive social connections. And so, so the approach that can, you know, emerged from this research I call name networks. And uh, the concept is uh, simple, but it's very, it turned out to be a very effective approach. So this approach looks for personal names in the content of, of each message. And it tries to identify social connections between group members based on who mentions whom. And so here's an example from Anne, message from Anne. And it says, Steve and Natasha, I couldn't wait to see your site. I knew it was going to be awesome. And here, so according to this uh, approach, you connect Anne to Steve, you connect Anne to Natasha. But you can also say, well, Steve and Natasha mention it, and clearly they work on the same project together. So they also have connections. So this way, even though Steve and Natasha, maybe they never posted any messages to this particular group, or maybe you only have limited sample, right? So in which uh, Steve and Natasha did not post anything. And especially with uh, studies uh, on Twitter data, when we talk about uh, the fact that we usually do a sample of tw Twitter data sets, as a result, it's quite often that you will, would miss some messages from some people in the group. So the ability to connect people who co-occur together uh, is, very, is very useful. And um, not surprisingly, there, uh, you know, the reason why this method is useful and effective is because main communicative functions of personal names is to get somebody's attention, to identify addresses, and also maintain and reinforce social relationships. Um, so it turned out to be that if uh, people are more comfortable with each other, they're more likely to use personal names in conversations. Uh, so we're using that information to derive networks. Uh, online, network uh, names are also one of the few textual carriers of identity. Uh, and also they, uh, they use is, their use is crucial for the creation and maintenance of a sense of community. So those are all characteristics that make this matter very useful. But there are also some challenges with uh, using names to predict and discover net, uh, connections. Uh, here's an example uh, that demonstrates those challenges. Uh, the network, again, coming from one of the online classes that I analyzed a few years ago, 
The red notes represent students in this class and names are, are non anonymized. Uh, the blue note, color notes are also notes of people or names, um, but they're not students in the class. For example, Kurt was referring to Kurt Cobain uh, from Ra Ragman Nirvana. Uh, Chris was a person, but he wasn't student in this class. He was student in some other class. Uh, Santa Monica was actually a public library, so not a person at all. And uh, Dewey was referring to the John Dewey philosopher and educator. And finally, Mark, in this case, not a person. It was actually part of sentences markup language. Uh, so as you can see, there are lots of challenges for such approach to be effective. It has to recognize personal names, but also uh, names that may not belong to group members. And so some of the solutions, of course, uh, that exist, uh, we call it name alias resolution. Due to the time limitation, I'm not going to go into you know, more details about how, how we do, to, uh, do name alias resolution. Uh, if, you, if you have interested and have questions about it, I'll be happy to chat with you afterwards. But here's a great example how the difference, what is the difference between chain networks that I talked about earlier and name networks. Uh, imagine YouTube video, and it has lots of comments um, at the end. And usually comments posted one, one after another. So you might think there is no really structure, conversational structure going on there. Uh, and that's what Chain Network will show you if you simply connect who posts, uh, who replies to whom uh, network. So we have this long, long noodle going there. But then if you apply name network approach, uh, that will look for a reference to people. In, on, in case of YouTube, it would look for usernames. Uh, it's actually obvious, though, for that particular example, there is a structure emerging. And you can see some clicks, you can see some uh, groups forming, you can see some more, more central uh, group members, less central. So you can actually tell more about uh, comments, simple comments on YouTube than you would normally would do without name networks. And so from uh, some of number of studies that where we tried to use name networks and validated it, we found that structurally the name networks, uh, they're more close to self-reported networks. Uh, so essentially, uh, it's a great alternative uh, versus doing you know, cost and time consuming surveys and interviews to discover those networks. So next, I'm going to sh show you a quick uh, case study uh, that um, I've done using name networks to analyze a community of block readers. And then I'm going to show you a quick demo. And then we're going to open up the um, floor for questions. So this case study is about a popular blog that attracts hundreds and hundreds of comments every day. So a blogger, it's a Canadian blog, it's about Canadian real estate also. And the blogger posts a message, a blog post every day, and bloggers, blog readers come to this website and they comment on it. These are some of the topics that this blog covers. The larger size, words represent the more popular topics, such as economy, money, real estate. And those of you who know someone in Vancouver or live in Vancouver, you know that there is a real estate bubble there. So clearly, topic is really important for the users of this website. Uh, so the questions for this particular study that I had was, can a blog support the development of an online community? As you know, blogs are not designed. Or originally, we're not, we're not designed to sustain an online community. Uh, but more and more often, we see that a, a, popu a popular blog would attract a lot of lots of uh, users. And uh, so the question is, can it uh, support? And then how do we know if a community has emerged among blocked readers? And to know that, uh, I really wanted to see the network rep representation of all of the people who posted comments to this blog. And so I applied the name network algorithm to comments from this block for multiple days to discover those networks and study them. And when I was doing that, I used two theoretical frameworks, uh, uh, specifically virtual settlement, uh, which talks about that prerequisite for online community to exist 
uh, is virtual common play, public place. So people will need one particular place on the internet to meet. And there should be some interactivity going on. And also, um, there should be sustained membership over time. I also use a sense of community theory from Mac Macmillan and Chavez, essentially talking about that people should feel belonging to this community and influence over what's happening in this group. And also, they need to have some kind of shared emotional co connections. Uh, so once uh, I next step was to take all the comments, and this is a simple form where people, block readers, come and fill out, leave their comments, um, and build ne networks from those conversations. I took uh, two different snapshots in 2008, 2009, uh, to see what kind of structures are emerging. And uh, at, you know, right away you see that there is a group of central users in this, uh, in this blog. They well connected. But once I look only at the connections, uh, strong connections between people, when you have three or more times somebody mentioned somebody else in this uh, blog, you see that in October 2008, actually there was only one user that really central in this network. And that wasn't the blogger, blogger himself. So essentially, there is no real community in, on this blog in 2008, because if that person doesn't comment, doesn't post any comments anymore, then the, there is no real connections between other people on this blog. But over time, you can see that more and more people taking more central role in, and more active roles in this group, and uh, more connections are emerging. And even though people use pseudonyms in, in, this, uh, in this blog, they actually starting to recognize each other's question. Can I ask, you said a strong connection was three or more yep. mentions of a person. Is that within a single post, or what, what's the snapshot here? Three or four mentions? Yeah, so this is for the whole uh, month of October. For the whole month. Of uh, so the blogger usually posts six uh, days a week. Uh, so essentially six, uh, six uh, days multiplied by four weeks, 24 days. And so that was in October. And then uh, in, in a few months, we took another snapshot. And so you can see changes in this group. And then you can essentially try to uh, interpret it, what's really happening in this community. And this is just uh, some numbers that represent that the general you know, centrality, people becoming more central in this group uh, and more connected, which is a positive sign. So this was a kind of case study. And we've done a number of different um, studies using this approach. So you can find them on, on our website, uh, socialmedialab.ca, uh, some of the publications. But I also invite you to try the tool itself, netlytic.org, see if it might be useful for your research. And uh, just to get, help you get started, I'll show you a quick demo of the tool. And then we'll, we'll open the floor for, for the questions. So you can, use, um, you can register for the system uh, yourself, or you can use OpenID to actually uh, create an account in the system. Uh, once you log in, you can uh, then import your data set. And we currently support a number of um, data sets that you can import. If you have an RSS feed for your group, uh, that's, that's very easy to do. And you can actually harvest new RSS feed messages uh, uh, over a longer period of time. So we will check. The system will automatically go to the source and take those new messages every day. Uh, some researchers. Um, it's actually based on our, our other research when we actually st ask uh, academics how they use social media for their research-related activities. So we learned that more and more researchers using Google Docs, Google Documents, to manage their um, research data. So they would use Google spreadsheets or uh, would uh, have uh, interview trans transcripts recorded in Google Docs. So essentially, we built that particular model to allow you to import data directly from your Google Docs. Uh, Twitter is another popular source of uh, data. So we have plugin for that uh, where you can com compile your search query and say, give me all Twitter messages uh, that includes uh, uh, you know, Oxford Internet Institute, OAI. Uh, and so it will also harvest data um, every hour to get some sample messages. And finally, uh, you can have your data as a let's say, Excel spreadsheet or a text file. You can try to import it using um, 
CSV files, comma separate value files. So essentially different formats, it's hard to account for all possible variations, but if you have some other formats in mind that you want to analyze or need help to import your data, so just, uh, just send me email, let me know. We're always adding, adding new uh, import modules. But so essentially once you edit your data, and for starters, you can just simply use the option public data sets. Uh, we just added this new feature. Essentially, if you want to share your own data set with others, uh, website users, you can do so. So you can use one of the public data sets to import uh, it to your new account to try out different features. So for demonstration purposes, I have a sample um, for one day for Twitter messages about London 2012 uh, from July. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just uh, use that uh, sample of thou about 1,000 Twitter messages to go through and show you some of the features of the system. So after you import it, uh, there's a step cleaning process. Uh, there are more information about each step on the website. Uh, so I'm just going to skip and jump right to the text analysis just so we can save more time on that. So in text analysis, essentially, uh, we think it's important before we actually jump into the you know, studying network structures. We kind of want to get a sense what's really happening from content perspective in particular community. So text analysis will help you with that by uh, first kind of extract frequently used uh, keywords in your data set. And so here, based on thousands of Twitter messages, from, uh, remember they, they're relatively short, but you already found about 10,000 frequently used um, you know, keywords. And so you can visualize results in the, in the form of tech cloud, where uh, the words that are more frequently used are larger, uh, appeared in larger size. So not surprisingly, things like Olympics and Olympic in London are frequently used. It is about uh, Olympics in London. Uh, but there are lots of support about Team GB, Team Great Britain here. Um, and considering that, that was a kind of international sample. It's, uh, it's great to see that um, you know, it has so, so much support more than any other teams here. Um, you can also see words like football. So clearly the sample represent Twitter messages during the, one of the popular uh, football games, uh, uh, soccer, right? And uh, some of the names, um, teams uh, like Brazil here also appear in this data set. And of course, you can, uh, or, or venues, Trafford venue. So you can click on any of the words to see all of the messages that mention that word. And Twitter messages are short, so essentially you cannot display them all at once. But because interface is designed to handle you know, all kinds of messages. So we're first showing you a snippet of the message where the word is mentioned. Um, so this way you can easily explore all of the messages just briefly scrolling up and down where this word was used. And you can always you know, click on that word to see, to see the full message. Something that we recently added, and we constantly improving it, it's a sentiment analysis feature. Uh, again, sentiment analysis, it's not 100% accurate, regardless of what data set you use or what methods you're using. But it's a great uh, ability for us uh, researchers, especially in social sciences, to g start getting to know what's really happening uh, in this particular data set. So here you can see that uh, 34, about twice as many, there are twice as many positive messages about Olympics than negative. You can click on um, um, the percentage of negative messages. And this tech cloud will only represent frequently used keywords among messages that are considered to be negative. And then you can, again, same way, you can click on any words like atmosphere here, and then you can read. So this message, uh, for example, see them. it says, some dead atmosphere inside Old Trafford. Uh, so kind of quickly gives you an idea what that maybe topics uh, tend to be negative or tend to, tend to be positive. We applied similar techniques when we analyze uh, Wall Street, uh, Occupy Wall Street protests. And it was interesting to, to see right away that words like police, you know, in the conversations on Twitter tend to, be, tend to have negative uh, connotation. So clearly it tells you what, what type of users tend to post messages uh, 
uh, online about that particular topic. Uh, and you can al always export those type of uh, frequently used words in your Excel and some other software you, you, know, you might want to use for additional analysis. Another category, another text analysis type of um, function, we call it categories. But essentially, it's um, you as a researcher might want to define a set of keywords or a set of phrases that, and define them as a specific um, category. Uh, for starters, we give you just sample category just to give you a sense, such as we group all of the adjectives in different uh, groups based on previous research. Let me just, so such as adjectives about appearance, condition, adjectives about feeling bad, feeling good, object, uh, you know, adjectives about quantity, sound, and so on. And so size, once you click on category, you see all of the uh, words that are part of this category. Uh, you can use different patterns to add or remove different keywords. Uh, some other types of categories that we used in the past included uh, geographic locations. For example, when we studied um, Canada Winter Games, uh, you know, we want to know how often different provinces have been mentioned in the data set. And because people on Twitter use different uh, abbreviations for different provinces, uh, we manually compile different categories that represent keywords, uh, phrases for, uh, that refer to different provinces. And sometimes they may be a popular um, sport team or a popular um, person coming from that province. So indirectly we can capture that, hey, this is actual reference to Ontario or this is reference to Nova Scotia. Another type of category that one of my students, she studied online forum about, um, you know, Lords of the Ring movie. And uh, so she wanted to know how people talk about evil places versus good places in this movie and, and then compare it to the book. Uh, so she created categories for all the you know, different places and look at this data from that perspective. So all kinds of you know, ways um, you can use those categories. But once you have it, the system will automatically count how many messages uh, actually in each, appear to be in each category. So based on this sample set of categories, uh, we can see that in this Olympic sample, you see a lot of um, messages that with adjectives feeling good. You can mouse over it, will tell you there are 184 messages. And you can click on it essentially to see specific um, adjectives that appear more or less frequently. So the word great appears 72 times. The word good, uh, excited, and so on. And then you can click on any of these boxes to actually see uh, the messages um, that include those adjectives. Yeah. Is this a list? This list isn't mutually exclusive, so messages could be in multiple categories. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And also, I forgot to show you the other form of representing and kind of exploring topics. If you hit visualize here. Uh, topics over time, essentially it shows you early, earlier messages and later messages. And uh, it shows different frequently used keywords. You can say I only want to see, you know, top 25 keywords or uh, top 50. But you can see where different, for example, Team Great Britain was mentioned a little bit at the beginning. The largest size of the area representing the number of messages. So Team Great Britain was mentioned a lot here then in the middle here and later on. Or the word park later on in the data set. So you might want to click on the particular word and also explore the messages why park was you know, mentioned. And it was about Park Avenue and, um, and so on. So finally, the, um, the main feature of this tool, network analysis, that I was uh, talking about uh, and specifically name network algorithm. We also, for other data sets, we also offer what I introduced as a chain network approach as well. But for you know, things like Twitter messages, uh, when there's no clear indication who is actually talking to whom, but you can use who information about who mentioned whom or who retweets whom to build the network, name networks is a very useful way to do it. So once you analyze the data set, it will show you how many uh, notes or 
people in this network and how many connections. Because this was a random sample and only 1,000 messages. You can see there are 1,100 people, but they are not really connected. They are not really talking to each other. 66 connection total here. Um, so it tells me right away that there is no real community going on, but it's still interesting to explore those 66 connections. So I'll, I'll hit visualize, essentially. And it starts with uh, people who are most frequently connected in this network. But you can always say see all and see all connections. And we'll show you all of the uh, people in this network. Uh, some of the people who have more connections, they will appear with the circle around them. So you can just uh, double click and it will show you, uh, show other connections um, to those individuals. And you can double click and the, it will disappear. There are different icons. For example, if there's a question mark, it means that that particular individual never posted to this data set but was mentioned by somebody else. Uh, here, so that, that's why there is a connection. And you can click on the line on the connection between um, people. It will show you the actual message why these people connected. So clearly, this is a retweet from a uh, women rights account, AI underscore, and it was retweeting um, this particular account. So that's why there is a connection. So. We thought that when developing the tool, we thought it's really important to have this interactive feature and be able to go back and forth to look at the content of the messages that help us to establish the connections. And then also looking at the network structures. Um, so if we're going to see all messages, it's going to warn us that there may be, you know, it may be a little bit too busy or depending on the size of the network, it may take longer. Um, but so if you spread it out, you can see some pockets uh, of nodes connections. You can play with the way they a little bit visualize. You can remove labels, essentially, to see that, as you can see, there is no one coherent network structure, so clearly no community here. But you might see some you know, clusters, right, like here. You might see some popular accounts. Uh, and again, you can click on the connection between accounts. And so there is an explanation why there is a connection established. Another useful feature, looking at it over time. So you can use this uh, filter here, going back at the beginning. And then it will sh move it slightly to show where connections started emerging. And so on. Um, because it uses flash-based visualization, it probably will be too slow, depending on your machine, to handle you know, millions of factors network. Uh, but so from our perspective, we don't want, you know, make it as a, you know, standalone tool because we realize in a lot of social network analysis uh, researchers are using multiple tools, uh, including uh, tools like Aura that has lots of, uh, from Carnegie Mellon University that has lots of uh, social network analysis methods or Node Excel that also has lots of uh, useful features. So for that purpose, we have an expert button here. OK, this is touch. That's not touch. Okay. Yes. Um, oh, so the little arrow uh, thing on the right, yep. press that, and you can get that hide, hide the options. This one? Nope. Uh, no, the tab. Oh, there you go. Yep. Uh, Thanks. There you can use the scroll bar. Perfect. So you can export your network in UCINet or Payak, and more expert options come in. But essentially, you can continue your analysis. We purposely did not include any uh, specific social network analysis metrics, such as centrality metrics, because we expect people to do a more advanced SNA social network analysis elsewhere. Uh, so, th so this is a tool, and we're adding lots of new features, and especially this week. So if you see any, any um, inconsistencies, let me know. Uh, but hopefully, you'll see how this tool can be useful uh, for your research and drop, drop me a note um, if you have any questions and I'm open for your questions right now as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is very interesting and I love the visualization Thank tool. You. Uh, but I must uh, uh, ask 
what does, and, I, and I'm sorry if I might sound a little bit like playing the devil's advocate here, what does this data actually tell us? I mean, effectively, what you started with, you know, in the survey was asking the students, you know, like how connected they mm -hmm. feel to each other. And most of these, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, factors are just telling us who is talking to who and what are they talking about. But in terms of the quality of debate and their relationship to each other, so it's missing, for instance, people bickering at each other. <laughs> the fact that someone is just talking more to another person does not really mean much. And a lot of news organizations are using other tools like you know, um, social bakers and you know, side catalysts. And all these similar tools are, are looking into sentiments and, and the type of discussions. And they are losing because they are depending on algorithms that count on the word count and not the, the context of the dialogue between the, the people. So they're losing the, the quality of debate. I mean, like, what does it mean? <laughs> what does it mean that mm -hmm. people are talking about Olympics in a negative way? Yeah. Well, a brief answer that if any system can answer that question itself, then we don't really need us researchers, so we're out of job. Uh, but uh, I guess my question is, how can you make the, the tool much smarter mm -hmm. in the sense yeah. of no, no, instead of looking into just words in absolute yeah. vacuum in, in the context of, you know, mm -hmm. no, it's excellent discourse question. analysis? Yeah. Uh, so essentially, we are moving towards that notion. And if you look back in the history of development of such tools, most of them started as a just simple tool that shows you word counts, as you mentioned. it. So now we're realizing that, hey, 70% of that data actually generated by users. So we really need to know their connections, who they connected to, where they're getting their information, because that additional dimension will tell us a little bit more about why they're posting it, how they're posting it, and so on. So in that uh, response, myself as a researcher and my colleagues trying to uh, integrate text analysis and network analysis together. And so these are early steps in this research in general, trying to merge those two fields together. And already, because I heard the same criticism about network you know, analysis, network representation. Well, if you're only looking at the network, you're missing the content. Why do people connect it? Uh, so to address that issue, we're trying to allow people to explore by clicking on the connection, you know, why people are connected. But the key, the key challenge mm -hmm. in such case, I mean, this would probably work excellently if you have a small data sample, because you will be able to go, as you showed us, through the, the, the text mm -hmm. between people and, and actually know that richness of, of uh, understand that richness. But when you have like a, a scale of like m millions of tweets or large scale of data, it would be impossible to actually go through all this without a much more intelligent system to, fi to find out how, how they are really talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And so you have to start with a sample and then moving towards combining text analysis and network analysis. <coughs> At least that's what I believe that will really help you to outline the communities. And then you can decide, okay, this is the group that I really want to focus on and then explore that in more details. Uh, but like you said, there are no tools that address, uh, you know, will do work for you as a researcher. At least um, the concept of Netlytic was to design a tool, something that will help you, like a bicycle that helped many of you come here to this class. Uh, um, so they make you faster, but you still have to do legwork. And you also have to incorporate some of the theories. So I mentioned a case study on the blogs and where we look at the theories, theories of virtual communities and sense of communities. So how do you automate that particular aspects? We don't know yet. But as a researcher, we can use the uh, output of these automated processes and then try to see how those outputs can, or whether they can actually indicate or help us to analyze uh, communities through those theoretical perspectives. So your concern is very legitimate, and that's something that dr drives uh, the development of Netlytic and other tools like that. So, so I really appreciate your comments. Yeah, thanks. Just a question about your example with Twitter. That's not using what you presented at the beginning, the name network, right? Because that's you're just doing visualizations based on word frequencies and things like that? Well, it, it does use name networks. Um, but essentially on Twitter, there are two types of na uh, names, right? There are nicknames, usernames, Twitter usernames, but there are also names of other personalities. Like here you see uh, Bellamy, it's a you know, pl uh, football player, right? And um, 
you see also usernames um, as well in this network. So this is the tech cloud of only names. So essentially, when you build a network, you can in, in Netlytic, you can say, I only want to have network uh, in, of Twitter users, or I want to include people who are not part of this, to, uh, you know, um, this group, but who are really important in this group. So essentially, the name network uh, works with both personal names uh, and uh, users. So it's, it's a word coherence network, a subset where it's the names. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's separate. From, so you're not trying to make connections of mentions. So the part you were, or as I understood it, you had the first half of your presentation, mm -hmm. it's about replicating a network of names when you don't have something like a Twitter handle that's explicitly tagged with an identity or some sort of hyperlink. And what you're talking about now with the Twitter, that's more just word co-occurrence limited to names. Just to understand, or am yeah, I... Yeah. Uh, no, just to clarify, the name network from... I'm looking at neighbor names as, a, you know, very broadly. Names include personal names and also usernames or nicknames. So this is not intersection, this is actually union of uh, usernames, who mention whom or who retweets whom, plus if anyone who, who mention in this data set personal names, those can also be included if you choose so. Okay. Uh, yeah. Because sometimes, let's say uh, right now we're collecting data on a uh, U.S. Uh, election. And a lot of people in their discussions, they use uh, Obama or Romney in the discussion. So you, as a researcher, you can decide if it's important for your research to include Romney and Obama as, n as nodes in your network. Then you can tell a name network that, hey, I do want to include it. So if you click on um, see more processing options here, we have a checkbox that essentially says include people who are not part of the group into the network. So if you say, if you hit this checkbox, Romney and Obama, uh, presidential candidates, will, um, will be included. If you're not, you're only focusing on people who actually posted at least one message to this group. Although it seems like there's two things going on there. One is a person is a topic, the other is a person is a person. Yep. Do you have a way of distinguishing that? Because they seem to me to be quite different things. Obama mm -hmm. as a topic yep. is very different from Obama as a person. Hashtag versus... Uh... Well, right now we're not talking hashtags. Uh, we're using the Twitter users versus people who are being uh, mentioned as subjects. Yeah. So at this moment, uh, the system can only recognize whether if you're part of a group, you posted at least one message to this group. So it's artificial definition or system perspective definition. And if you never posted the message but mentioned by someone, then you outside a group. So then you, as a researcher, you have to uh, you know, decide, are those people uh, used as a subject for the conversation, popular individuals, uh, or are they actually part of the group? But uh, yeah, thank you. So I'll, I'll go on record as saying I'm sick of Twitter data. I'm sick of, uh, there, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, IPP is coming up, and I can guarantee you, you're going to see more Twitter than you can shake a stick at. Uh, I would like it if you have an opportunity to speak about some of the other data that you can analyze with this, especially, for example, message boards. Mm -hmm. Because while Twitter is an utterly flooded field with everybody and their dog trying to get data out of this, there's a profound paucity of tools for analyzing message boards despite their uh, utility. I don't know if you have any canned examples here, but I know that you do do that among other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, it, it, in speaking to that, is it possible to speak about um, uh, I, I guess, in a sense, how you how you arrive at um, how you arrive at some of these uh, um, sort of inferences about names. Is it just regular expressions in there? Mm -hmm. Do you just grind mm -hmm. through this? Do because it almost looks like you're actually using something a little more NLP-ish. It's mm -hmm. like somebody said, or yep. I was talking to, yep. and because that seems like it's harder to do than just at mentions. Yep. And so actually Twitter is an easy example because if you're only using usernames, there is no really need for natural language processing to recognize names. Uh, but the system was developed originally to analyze online forums. And that was part of my actual dissertation work to look at the online forums. And there uh, I had to figure out how do you recognize person, first name, last name, middle name. And so there are a number of NLP approaches built in into the system. 
Yeah. And so essentially, if you have a data set that uh, you can represent as a, in an Excel spreadsheet, uh, so each row represents a message. So the system only needs uh, two fields, who send the message, and it can be username or per, uh, first name, last name, and then the text of the message. Ideally, it also would like to know the date when the message was posted, because some of the visualizations allows you to show data over time. Uh, so essentially, if you have those three columns, uh, that's all you need to start describing those networks. And so again, it can be Excel data format, it can be spreadsheets, it can be for listservs, for example. And I do have an example. Um, let me actually quickly show you. Uh, lots of uh, public listservs, they have their archives saved as a text file, as a single text file. And so if you go to the front of the interface, scroll down a little bit, there is a button called Tour the System as a Guest. And actually there I use um, the listserv, the Internet Researchers listserv archive, uh, which was uh, imported as a single text file, and the system able to recognize where each message starts and where it ends. Uh, so essentially you can do all that analysis that we talk about it based on, um, based on listservs data. And so here you might see some familiar names, um, since many of you are part of the Internet researchers listserv, I would imagine. And additionally, so I mentioned there's a name and chain network. So because this is a listserv, you also have these threaded discussions. And so we can visualize different colors to represent different types of connections. Uh, so here the blue will represent reference by name, and the dark area, people don't reference by name, but they reply to each other. So you can also, say, depending on your research questions, you can say, well, maybe this uh, purple line here that re reference by name represents more close, con you know, personal connection or conversation versus uh, conference announcements. <coughs> um, so there are different types you can import into the data set. And right now, uh, for example, YouTube um, announced their new a version for the API that allows us to import comments from public YouTube uh, videos. So I know a number of researchers are interested in doing that. And so we're building the additional module that you can simply specify what YouTube video you want to analyze, what comments, and it'll just grab it. Yeah. Does it answer? Is yeah, yeah. I'm wondering, uh, what about PHPDB? Uh, you, you did message boards. I can't just mm -hmm. point it to that. I have to sort of be an Does it have If it has RSS feed of those mes messages, it's very easy. Like Google uh, discussion boards, they do have that. Uh, the other option, when um, my student did research on Lords of the Ring forum, that forum used the older version of forums and didn't have RSS feed. So what we use, we use a system called, from Yahoo called Dapper, Open Dapper. It um, allows you to take um, messages and represent as RSS feed. Open.dapper.com, no, .net, sorry. And essentially, this system it can, can be used as an intermediate step towards importing your data into Netlytic, it will take a page, a static page, and you'll show you show the system where each message starts, where the username appears in that message, and then generate RSS feed. And then you take a URL for that RSS feed, and then go back to Netlytic and import that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you analyze and merge data from different websites? Show has only a Twitter dataset or a blog dataset. Can you merge data oh. from different website? Of course, you have to identify a single user, mm -hmm. the same user in different uh, mm -hmm. website. It could be useful. Well, that's that would and be how much is yeah. hard to do. It is hard, and this is uh, would be a next generation of this tool. Right now, it doesn't do that. So essentially, what you're saying that set of users. They, they are occupying multiple websites yes. or communities in multiple sets. So that's, I think, the next step in this research in general. How do you reconcile different identities? And I know Bernie done a number of research on online identity. And so the question first would be, is it a um, good idea to do that? Because sometimes we don't want, we want, we play different roles or represent different identities on different websites. So is it uh, legitimate for us as researchers to merge those identities? 
but in some cases maybe it is okay and maybe that's the research question. So how do you do that? Um, right now, Netlytic doesn't, doesn't allow you other than having different data sets and then having multi different visualizations side by side and just seeing what's really happening. Is uh, it gender sensitive? Um, when you say, uh, for what kind of analysis? So you, yeah. the pictures and the visualization yeah. were all men, so was it, was, it, was it sensitive to, you know, like recognizing female names and male names or? Yeah. No, in the network. In the network. Well, it recognized any names regardless of gender. But would it be able to say like, a girl talking to a guy? Oh. Or <laughs> uh, no, it's uh, see it was gender non-specific. But it would be really yeah. interesting if yeah. you had this this visualization you had mm -hmm. before. Yeah. Uh, instead of, of the having, network. Yeah, of the network. Yeah, right now it doesn't. You see how who is talking? This one. Like so, you would have yeah. people with long hair, for instance, and mm -hmm. <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> hair or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. just a way to to see. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It'd be really interesting because in all data for researchers, you do look into categories of groups, Absolutely. Or racial, gender. Absolutely. Right now, yes. So how do you combine that? Doesn't this system doesn't do it right now? But this is something that would be really useful for future. If a data set has a profile information or demographic information associated with each node in this network, so overlay that information on, the, on this net on this uh, network. And the reason we haven't done that because uh, we wanted to make a generic tool as possible, and we wanted to rely on just text-based conversations to discover those networks. So. As soon as we start uh, doing such a customization you know, like for Facebook or Twitter, and those of you who've done some custom-made uh, scripts for those platforms, you know they change it all the time, uh, so it takes a lot of resources. So from that perspective, we kind of stayed away from combining it, but more and more I see the needs for ability to say, well, give me more information about this particular indivi individual. And, um, but uh, this point doesn't do yet. But at the same time, uh, the new feature we just added, uh, it will allow you when you build um, the network, you can also integrate popular topics in the network and represent them as a, as a node. So essentially you're building two mode, what we call two mode networks. And that may help researchers to say, well, if there are two groups, they may be around, grouping around two different topics. Um, plus now that we have the sentiment analysis uh, engine part of the part of netlytic we can also use different colors to represent uh, negative and positive what we call connections in this network uh, so yeah so adding new features would be next step yeah all right i have um, two quick do we have oh, time for two we, we're, we're oh well close. yes we're yeah. close. i don't um I, I think uh, i think anatoly will probably be sticking around for another couple minutes afterwards if uh uh, if anyone wants to uh, chat with them individually, but uh, before then, I'd just like to uh, uh, thank you for uh, a great talk and uh, uh, thank you for coming along and asking questions and uh, yeah. just being there. All right, so thank, thank you, you for your questions. Yes, thank you. <laughs>